This is going to sound weird, but Vecna might be more popular than D&D itself. Look at this. We got Google search data for the term D&D compared to the term Vecna. And for a few days around the end of May 2022, more people were looking for information about this D&D villain than about the game of D&D. And we can be pretty certain the main reason behind this sudden interest in Vecna was not planned by the lead designers at Wizards of the Coast, but it is why they're suddenly producing Vecna videos, toys, and adventures. And I think it just so happens to fit perfectly into something they have been planning for almost a decade. That's right, we are going deep into the full-on D&D Vecna conspiracy to break down who this evil lich character really is, why he suddenly went mainstream, and how Vecna will influence the next evolution of D&D coming in 2024, and what this all has to do with these mysterious obsidian obelisks planted in many of D&D 5e's official campaigns, and why, in a few years, we'll all be playing Dungeons and Liches. Okay, that last part's a joke, because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing D&D together, but this is actually a big deal. From Adventure Time to Harry Potter, Over the Garden Wall, Critical Role, and now Stranger Things, liches are infamous enemies for a reason. Imagine this. <clears throat> a cool breeze from ahead brings with it the stench of decomposing flesh. Skeletal feet grate against the ground as the lich circles the room, its ghastly features calm, even patient. Chipped shards of bone pierce the creature's rotten skin, causing the ominous glow from its fiery eyes to cast eerie shadows along its emaciated face and golden crown. That scene perfectly depicts this immortal, undead, intelligent, and powerful soul-stealing spellcaster that we call a lich. And yeah, it's from Describe's online library of box text for DMs and players, save 10% with the link below. But the point is, the Lich, much like the dragon and the vampire, is a villainous archetype in fantasy. It's why we see Liches, or people trying to become Liches, in all fantasy fiction. It's why Vecna, even before the events of the last few weeks, was already considered one of the greatest D&D villains of all time. But before we can talk about Vecna becoming the future of D&D, we need to answer this question. Who the heck is Vecna? And we can't really go into that topic without first talking about the also famous eye and hand of Vecna. Fortunately, Chris Perkins, lead designer of D&D 5e, can help us out. Vecna's been around forever. Um, Vecna showed up in the earliest books of D&D. He started off really as just a pair of magic items. Let's put it that way. And I believe Eldritch Wizardry um, back in the 70s. A pair of magic items called the Eye and the Hand of Vecna. This, these are the sole living remains of a very powerful long dead lich. That's cool. I did not know the Hand and Eye of Vecna technically existed in D&D fiction before the character. But this book, Eldritch Wizardry, published for original D&D in 1976, establishes the main lore we still see today. How the hand of Vecna can only be used by attaching it to one's own handless arm, and how it causes the user to become, quote, totally evil. It also says that the more you use the power of Vecna's hand, the harder it becomes to remove it. And in all caps, none of the effects of the hand may be altered in any way, even wishes or acts of the gods are useless in this regard. This part didn't really carry over into the modern day, though it is funny to see how the book suggests powers for the hand from tables elsewhere in the book, but leaves space labeled actual powers for whatever they want the hand to actually be able to do. And one neat piece of old school lore about the eye of Vecna is that the eye may not have originally belonged to Vecna, but to some feline creature. And as a brief aside, that's kind of irrelevant but still interesting, the name Vecna is an anagram of Vance, referring to fantasy author Jack Vance, who influenced how magic works in D&D. Now, let's see if Mr. Perkins can tell us more about who Vecna really was. I mean, Vecna originated as an entity on Greyhawk, the, or rather Orif, or the world of Greyhawk. He, he sort of started out there, but then went cosmic. At one point, he was the Dark Lord of a Ravenloft domain until that ceased to exist. Uh, but we don't know much about Vecna's sort of day-to-day -day life. Okay, 
two things here. One, I was able to find online that Vecna was born into a now long-gone tribe of mystics called the Urflan, that he had a mother named Maisel, that they both worshipped an even older deity called Moxlik, the serpent, one of the ancient brethren, and that Vecna ended up ruling a huge empire. That's all important later. And in a vague way, that is all backed up in the brand new Vecna dossier they just published for 5e. But two, yes, Vecna was a lord in Ravenloft bound to the domain of dread called Cavidius, but in the brand new dossier, Cavidius is just the name of his palace somewhere between the elemental planes of earth and fire. And my friend, Watsi was already planning this change when they released Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft over a year ago, because we got all this info about the domains of dread, but Vecna's domain, Cavidius, is not even mentioned here. The only mention of Vecna in this book is under another domain of dread, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Back to you, Chris. That said, there is some lore tied to Vecna that has survived through multiple editions. Um, one of the best pieces of that is his lieutenant, who um, they had a falling out, and it led uh, this lieutenant named Kass was actually responsible for mutilating Vecna to the extent that he lost a hand and an eye. While the original sword of Kass in Eldritch Wizardry is sentient, evil, and corrupts the wielder, it wasn't until three years later in the AD&D DM's Guide that it becomes this divisive force between Kass and Vecna described by Perkins. And his sword was constantly urging him on, saying that Kass was now greater than Vecna himself. And with the might of the sword to aid and direct him, Kass could rule in Vecna's stead. Legend says that the destruction of Vecna was by Kass and his sword, but at the same time, Vecna wrought his rebellious lieutenant's doom, and the world was made brighter thereby. So only later on did we get this connection that the sword was used against Vecna to essentially create the hand and eye as the distinct magic items they are today. According to that lore, the epic battle ended with them both being shunted to their own domains of dread in the Shadowfell, as if sentenced to battle each other for eternity. But the 5e change in Van Richten's only mentions Kass's domain, Tovag, where we get this little snippet. In truth, Vecna escaped and grew in power over ages and across worlds. So in the 5e canon, we know that this snippet is referencing a pivotal second edition AD&D module, Die, Vecna, Die, in which Vecna escapes his domain of dread using the soul of another demigod who tapped into ancient 10th level spells Vecna created with the help of that ancient brethren, the Serpent. Then Vecna travels to Sigil. Some sort of a, a Sigil. Sigil, the main hub of the Planescape setting, and is trapped there by its overseer, the Lady of Pain, who just so happens to be another of these ancient brethren. But here, he officially becomes a greater deity than is presumably killed by the player characters. According to that adventure, as Vecna is struck down with the Sword of Kass, he says, You will pay, you puny, and doesn't finish that sentence before he's sucked into some portal, but essentially freed from Sigil. And here is why all of that matters. Die Vecna Die was officially the end of AD&D 2nd Edition. The designers used Vecna's plot and his evil influence on si Sigil in-game to justify reshaping the D&D multiverse into what would become 3rd Edition. So, for the purposes of our grand D&D conspiracy, Here's the most important snippet of lore teased in that interview with Mr. Perkins. Because one thing that Vecna has always strove for is godhood, sort of the narcissist's dream, right? And uh, Vecna has chased it throughout adventures that we have uh, published featuring him. So even he has not achieved everything yet uh, in, in some versions of this story. And I think that's another way you can do is you're basically trying to stop this powerful evil from ascension. Vecna has always chased godhood, and even he has not achieved it in some versions of the story. Well, one of those versions is 5th edition D&D, where Vecna is not listed in the pantheon of the primary setting, the Forgotten Realms. So in this primary 5e timeline, so to speak, we know we have a version of Vecna who is working in the shadows, actively striving to achieve godhood. 
This is also backed up by the new dossier, which includes a Vecna stat block with him as an arch lich, not a demigod or a god. And we know that when Vecna does achieve godhood, the ramifications have been used before by Wizards of the Coast as an in-game apocalypse, justifying the switch from one edition to the next. And we already know, though I guess I haven't referenced it yet, that WotC has officially announced the next evolution of D&D coming in 2024. We have, earlier this year, we began work on the next evolution of Dungeons & Dragons, uh, new versions of the core rule books, which will be coming out in uh, 2024 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dungeons & Dragons. So we are headed toward this endgame and rebirth of the D&D multiverse, and we are almost ready to talk about how I think Vecna is going to do it, but first, Let's talk about Vecna in mainstream media. Recently, I made a video about the peak popularity of D&D 5e, specifically when the number of Google searches for the term D&D hit its all-time high in the summer of 2020, marking the point where the year-after-year -year growth of D&D finally hit some ceiling. And for two years, we stayed pretty close to that ceiling. Then, at the end of May 2022, D&D broke through that ceiling, and if you watched that video, you probably already know why. Yes, this extremely popular Netflix show about a couple of kids in the 80s uncovering a secret government operation that connects their little hometown to a dark plane of existence, and in which these main characters draw analogies between the otherworldly monsters Oh. Between the otherworldly monsters they face and the game they play in their free time, Dungeons & Dragons. So whether or not you watch the show, you should know that Stranger Things has been a major force behind the resurgence of D&D over the last eight years, and that in this final season, the villain is referred to as Vecna. And that's pretty much it, much like the other D&D analogies made in the show, it's not heavily based on the game at all. But unlike the Demogorgon and the Mind Flayer, interest in Vecna skyrocketed when this season began, propelling Google searches for Vecna beyond searches for even D&D. And personally, I don't believe D&D designers had any influence over what D&D villain the creators of Stranger Things were going to use next. I think this part was just a happy coincidence. At the very least, WotC knew about this choice before the general public, because they did release this Vecna toy on March 1st, 2022, over a month before Vecna was revealed as the Season 4 villain. And as a much smaller but still significant proponent of D&D in the mainstream, yes, Vecna was also the main villain of Critical Role's first campaign, where they provided the first visceral exposure to Vecna for millions of players who came to D&D during 5th edition. And he's probably going to be the main villain of their animated series if they make it to a third season. Notably, Critical Role's influence on the D&D 5e canon does give us some new data points on Vecna in The Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, where he is listed among the Betrayer Gods. Vecna calls no place among the plains his home, instead wandering in search of powerful artifacts and secrets to further his unknowable plots. Then, this next excerpt actually sheds a little light on his otherwise unknowable plots, telling us Vecna's motivation even beyond godhood. Vecna loathes all other gods and wishes to destroy them and become the sole divine power in the plains. Also, commandments of Vecna. Learn all you can and keep hidden that which you know. Reveal what pieces you must, but never the whole. Express and cultivate the evil within yourself, and in doing so, recognize it in others to exploit them for your own benefit. Seed the ruin of all who worship other deities until only those who kneel before Vecna remain. Okay, now we are ready for the final piece of this Vecna conspiracy puzzle. How I think Vecna is going to implement his evil plan, and it involves... These. Really, the mysterious obelisk included in several official 5e campaign books, practically as easter eggs, but with no apparent reference until now. And I have to give major credit to Jordan, of Jordan the PH's silent YouTube channel, whose videos were an incredible help in all of this Vecna research, and who laid 99% of the groundwork on this obelisk conspiracy idea in a video he released almost two years ago. Linked in the description. And the main piece that we need that Jordan pointed out is how the 5e campaign book, 
Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frostmaiden, pretty much reveals the purpose of these strange artifacts and confirms their connection to Vecna all in one little sidebar, Secret of the Obelisks. In this adventure, we learn the secret of the obelisks that have appeared in other 5th edition adventures published by Wizards of the Coast, including Tomb of Annihilation and Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. The first group of these magical obelisks was crafted by a secret society of spellcasters called the Weavers. Okay, the Weavers is new. I couldn't find anything about who they are or what their society of spellcasters might be like, but obviously there's a connection to the Weave, which is the canonical name for how magic works in the Forgotten Realms and 5e D&D. These obelisks could alter reality on a grand scale, sending a region or an entire world back to an earlier time, effectively erasing part of history. The obelisks were constructed to counteract the effects of calamitous spells and cataclysmic events. This is exactly what I'm talking about with an apocalyptic shift that the designers could use to justify changing the D&D multiverse from our current edition to the next. And it all makes total sense that 5e designers might use this to erase a bunch of the problematic lore in the 5e Forgotten Realms as we shift into this next evolution. But here's the big part. An evil wizard named Vecna stole one such obelisk and used it to erase the obelisk creators from existence. This explains the designer's reasoning for there being zero current information about the weavers. Vecna also stole the knowledge needed to create new ones. That knowledge later came into the possession of the Netherese wizards who built similar obelisks of their own. They believed that if some catastrophe destroyed their empire, these obelisks could help restore it. Okay, but do we really think this evil god or demigod lich whose first commandment says, learn all you can and keep hidden that which you know, reveal what pieces you must, but never the whole? Do we really think that guy accidentally let slip the knowledge of how to create these obelisks? No way. He wanted these instructions to come to the Netherese wizards for the very reason that when, not if, when they chose to activate the obelisks, these obelisks built with his instruction manual, they would rewrite history, putting Vecna in power over everything. And if this theory is finally making sense, please give this video a like so I know that I'm not losing it. But then, something happened that not even Vecna could have predicted. Unfortunately for them, most of the obelisks built to protect Netheril were stolen or otherwise lost over time, as were records of their purpose and information about how to activate them. I think the fall of the Netherese Empire was part of Vecna's plan. That's why he gave them the instructions on how to create them, all under the guise of some failsafe for the Netherese Empire that they could use to save themselves. But in his own hubris, Vecna didn't foresee the possibility that the Empire would not save themselves with these obelisks. So they were never activated, and this delayed his plan by about 1,500 years. But it didn't stop him. Today, Several of these obelisks have been discovered in these other 5e adventures, and Rime of the Frostmaiden also includes instructions for how to activate the one in this adventure at least. And it just so happens we're less than two years away from an edition change, and it just so happens that Vecna is more popular a character than ever, we are primed for an edition ending campaign book in which a cult of Vecna has uncovered these obelisks and has prepared to activate them, not to bring back Vecna to the Forgotten Realms, but to bring the entire Forgotten Realms to a time under Vecna's control. And the bottom line is that even if this was not the decade-long plan of Watsi lead designers, now that Vecna is almost as much of a household name as D&D itself, thank you Stranger Things, they would be fools to not use this idea. So if you agree or disagree or have anything to add, please leave it in the comments. Then let's sit back and see what happens on the way to that 2024 shift. But in the meantime, watch this video about the peak of D&D 5e. Consider subscribing or joining Patreon. But thank you for your support in any way you're able to give it. And keep building.